We're in the, uh, the book of Daniel as we get to chapter 2 this week and review a couple of events that uh, are of important context. And as we talked about last week, we it's a great, Daniel's a great study as we saw last week just because of, of the character of this young man taken into this captivity at the age of 15 or 16. Fortunately, he's got a couple of his buddies uh, with him that we were introduced to uh, last week. And they are able to, or they determine their heart that they will not defile themselves in any way. And by that mean, they're going to continue to follow God's word, whether it's politically correct or not, whether it's inconvenient or not. Uh, they've made a commitment. They purposed in their heart, as they said, not to defile themselves. And, uh, and that was the, the thrust of the message. Now, Daniel, they've been through this three-year training and been considered uh, wiser than the other wise men in Babylon and so forth. And we see God moving them and kind of elevating them. And that process is going to skyrocket in terms of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has been having. He's been having it for quite some time. Uh, remember that uh, it's, it's a quick history here, 605 B.C., uh, is when he uh, uh, invades uh, uh, Israel. Uh, they've already uh, taken out the, uh, the Assyrians and had a huge battle against the Egyptians and so forth. And they're pretty much the, uh, the reigning power, you know, in that part of the, uh, of the world. Uh, his father, Neil Palaser, is, uh, is dying. So he, he makes the trek in a month and gets back to, um, to uh, Babylon there. Uh, in time to uh, be crowned the new, the new king. He's got Daniel with him and so forth. Uh, he's there because, uh, uh, so there won't be a, a coup and somebody else attempt to take his, his place. Because of that, there's, um, remember we said that um, uh, Jehoiakim, remember that Korean king of Judah, Jehoiakim, you know, he's taken in that captivity. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, uh, uh, then in 597, a friend of his, the last Chinese ruler over Israel, Jehoiachin, he's, he rebels. And so, uh, just stay with me. He, uh, so then they've got to go back. Um, Nebuchadnezzar goes back and basically this time, Titan's control takes 10,000 uh, Jews with him as slaves back to, uh, to Babylon once again. Uh, there's another rebellion, and, uh, and he has to go back in 588. A couple of these dates are important. So hang in there. There won't be a test later. 588, he's got to go back. A two-year siege, and then they take the city. And this time, because it's the third time, he totally wipes out Jerusalem. It's burned to the ground. Everybody is pretty much either enslaved or they're killed. There are some that have fled to Egypt uh, previously. Uh, they leave a few of the poorest of the poor there to uh, continue their farming and, and maybe produce a little tax revenue and, uh, and so forth. But the big number there is, is 586. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Babylon becomes unique in the Bible beyond anything else uh, in terms of ancient empires. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a, a dream uh, in this chapter. It's going to trouble him for several years. It's a reoccurring dream. It's not a singular. It's not a one event. It's reoccurring. It bothers him because of the, the magnitude of it. It bothers him because he's troubled against the, about the future. And it bothers him because apparently he can't remember a lot of the details of it. And somehow he realizes they are significant. And eventually then he's going to call his wise men around him to say, hey, interpret the dream. Tell me what's going on. Because he has a sense of foreboding. But uh, again, a very, uh, very unique empire for uh, a couple of reasons. Let's take a look at the, the first 11 verses. And I've kind of broken it up in, into five, uh, five points. The first one is Nebuchadnezzar's requirement seemed uh, unjust. You'll see what I mean as we uh, get into this a little more. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Notice plural. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. 
Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have to cut into pieces. <laughs> Excuse me. I will, <laughs> a little fierce here. I'll have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his uh, servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king answered, I am certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks for is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. Nebuchadnezzar's requirements seem pretty unjust to, to, to these guys, and it's important that we kind of get introduced uh, to them. Again, he's having the dream. It's a reoccurring dream. And so he says to them, I need it interpreted. Fine, tell us the dream. We'll attach some meaning somewhere, you know. <laughs> We're good at this. And, uh, but apparently he, he's kind of on to them. He says, you guys have conspired telling me wicked things and things that are not true. So here's the test. You say you can tell the future? Great, tell me the past. Tell me what I've already dreamed. That seems reasonable to me. Tell me the dream and then I'll know that you really have the interpretation uh, for it. And again, uh, important to uh, be introduced to these wise guys. And uh, several names are used for them. But we would say that Babylon is unique in the Bible for a couple of reasons. One is because of these wise guys. By the time we get to the dream, it's going to be about the kingdoms, the empires that ruled in the ancient world. Daniel is going to tell us in advance, starting from Nebuchadnezzar, who the ruling empires would be. He's standing in the 6th century, and he's going to tell in advance about 300 years of history or, uh, in, in advance. That's why, as we said last week, this book is so attacked in terms of its authorship and its dating and so forth. This is not the only time David, uh, excuse me, Daniel does it. Uh, in two more chapters, he will go into great detail about history, telling it in advance and in great detail. Therefore, you have one of two choices. You can either believe that God spoke to Daniel, by the way, that means he exists and that he interacts with man, that he put this dream in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, that he's sovereign over all kings and everything that's happening in the world. That's option one. And that therefore his, his word is inspired. Option two is this. You believe that somebody not in, in the 6th century BC, but somebody in about the 2nd or 3rd century, looking back is just recording history and writing it down as it have already happened. Uh, that's your other option. Of course, you've got to explain a couple of things. You've got to explain how a guy in the 2nd or the 3rd century knew the language and the details of it and the details of the court and, and, and so forth that nobody else knew in that time. Of course, you could believe that somebody in the 2nd century got a little time capsule, went back 300 years, got out of his time capsule, had his little digital recorded with him so he could record the language, the Aramaic particular style that they spoke in that day that they didn't speak later, 300 years later, record all that. Observe all of the events, get in his time capsule, and go back to 300 AD. Jump out. Now, now, having seen history, he writes it down in the Aramaic that they only spoke in that time and disguise it so it looks like somebody wrote it in the 6th century. That's your other option. I think option one, that God inspired the whole thing, that he's sovereign, that he troubled particular Nebuchadnezzar with this dream. He's going to use it because he's going to give the interpretation to Daniel so that he can be raised up and elevated to a position equivalent to a prime minister of the most powerful empire that was on the earth at, at that time. That's so much of what this chapter is about. When it... It begins, it starts with the head of gold, jumping ahead a little bit, it starts with Babylon. And that kind of begs the question, well, 
What about the Assyrians? They were a pretty big world empire. What about the Egyptians? They were a huge world empire even previous to them. Why don't they come into play in all of this? Why doesn't Daniel start out? Why doesn't God orchestrate the events and say, first there were the Egyptians, as you know, then there were the Assyrians, as you know. No, he starts with Nebuchadnezzar, and he starts with the Babylonians because they are unique. Two reasons. They are unique uh, because of these wise guys because of the Babylonian religion. They are unique because the Babylonian religion uh, is still around us today. What is the, uh, if you're not sure about this, what is the best-selling book among children worldwide today? Harry Potter. Guess what that is? That is the Babylonian religion. As we talk in some detail about these, these names, what does it mean to be an astrologer, a Chaldean, and so forth? What does that mean? We'll see that it's still around. One of the things that they said they were able to do is slice the sky in equal elements so that they could read the future. That's still around, isn't it? It's still around. And so it, when, when God then gives us in advance world empires, he begins with this one, not the Assyrians, not the Egyptians, this one's because of these wise guys, because their religion is still around. It's still around. It was prominent, uh, huge in, in their day, and we'll, as we'll see, very occultic. Uh, it ends up uh, <clears throat> coming into the Roman world uh, via a man you're familiar with named Julius Caesar. He was totally into the Babylonian religion. And uh, in he propagated it within the Roman world and thinking and, uh, and so forth. In fact, he, he comes up with the idea of the Roman emperors being called uh, Pontus Maximus, uh, the bridge builder, you know, the, the God-man. He comes up with that uh, the idea, the bridge between God and man. And of course, that title then ends up being taken later and brought right in the Western church. So some of those ideas are still perpetuated today. It's, uh, it's throughout our, our, our culture, in the, in the Western world in particular, the Babylonian religion is alive and well. And basically, no matter what other religion you're looking at it, whether it's Buddhism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, or anything else, you can trace all of its roots back to Babylon. That's where it comes from. Let me just read to you from Revelation. This is an event still future, again, because Babylon is still mentioned during the tribulation period. Revelation 17, 3 says, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert. And again, this is real prophetic kind of language, so just kind of bear with me. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. Lots of symbolism here. And had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. She's obviously royalty, tremendously powerful, and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And this is talking about spiritual adulteries, turning away from God, blasphemous things. The title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. So here in the future yet, during the Antichrist reign, in the Great Tribulation, the Babylon religion is still prominent. It's still there. It's considered blasphemous uh, against God. Again, very occultic. And... Um, and if you read on into chapter 17, we'll see the symbol of this woman that this religion has, has permeated the world leaders at that time. So, the wise guys, their religion, the Babylonian religion, it's very prominent in the Bible because it's with us today. It will stay with us until Jesus Christ comes back to the earth and, and destroys it. And that's why the, this vision begins with the idea of, of Babylon. The second reason... Is, uh, is because of the fact that uh, uh, everything changes uh, here, prophetically, historically, and so forth. In 586, I told you that day was going to come back. 586, <laughs> Jerusalem is leveled, burnt to the ground. At that point, the Bible says we enter a period of time known as the times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles. Uh, the, the Jews are not going to rule and reign like they were, like they had been up until that time uh, in Israel with a somewhat of a Davidic line, a son of David uh, on that throne. Yes, they will go back 
Uh, 70 years later, yes, they will rebuild, uh, but it will never be the same again. And if you're not sure if it's still the same today, you might look at the Temple Mount sometimes in the news and see a little gold building there, uh, and that will tell you we are still in the times of the Gentiles. And that will last until Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth once again, wipes all that out, and then puts his throne in that city, and someone from that divinic line, Jesus Christ himself, will rule and reign from Jerusalem. A little side note, again, we're in the times of the Gentiles. These wise guys and their religion are still around today. So when we get to the dream, when we look at this, Babylon is prominent. It continues, that name at least, and what it represents continues to be very prominent when we look at Bible uh, prophecy. Let's look at these names just uh, for a moment. Uh, they are referred to in verse 2 as magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, uh, and astrologers. Uh, New King James has them as magicians, uh, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. Uh, magician was a term, uh, a general word for those that practice the occult. Uh, enchanter or astrologer is only used twice in the Old Testament here in Daniel. It's those who ex uh, did exorcisms and practice inc incantations. Uh, sorcerer means to bewitch or to cast a spell. Did I tell you this is the Harry Potter crowd or, or what? Again, Chaldean, sometimes uh, uh, translated uh, astrologer, refers to a particular priestly class in Babylon, and they were calling the shots. They, they were the ones that were really ruling and trying to rule over Nebuchadnezzar as, as, the, as the king. They were very, uh, very political. And then diviners is another term. Those that can ascertain or degree the fate of others by gazing uh, in, into the stars. This is who Daniel hung out with. <laughs> he's about 19 years old now. And uh, he's one of the boys, <laughs> but trying to be kosher, you know, and be faithful to God. And which we saw last week, man, he determined whatever happened, he was going to follow the word of God. We're going to see in a crisis, the first thing he does is pray. We'll find out later he gets thrown into a lion's den. Why? Because he prayed three times a day, always facing Jerusalem. Remember the phone call he got last week from his mother, the report he was able to give? He was doing okay because he was going to follow the word of God. He was going to pray every day and stay in fellowship with these three other guys uh, that, are, that are with him. Nebuchadnezzar's requirements seem unjust, but God is behind the whole thing. Two, Nebuchadnezzar's demand reaches Daniel. We see this in verses 12 to 16. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. So again, the, Daniel inquires about the demand and, and what's, uh, what's going on here. Uh, and then uh, I, I would say too that he believes that he, uh, the requirement that's there is really from God, that he can see that God is orchestrating events uh, this is too strange. I mean, here they are. They're hauled off to captivity. They go through this three-year period of training. God exalts them. They're accepted as, uh, again, of this, this class of advisors uh, to the king himself, although still really just a, a slave uh, in the position of a slave. But we notice he's got access to the king. He can go right in uh, and, uh, and speak to the king. But uh, a strange series of events, all of them are about ready to be killed um, again, when strange things are going on in our lives, we have to believe that God's in it somehow. Somehow God's going to use it for good. What's going on here? This is too strange. I shouldn't have a flat tire today of all days. You know, I shouldn't really be stuck here in this airport. After all, I've got some place to go. Sometimes it, when the circumstances get very difficult, we can really start looking around and say, well, God, you're interrupting me. Maybe it's for a reason. I think that's what's going on uh, here with Daniel, uh, and as Esther would say later, uh, in the same vicinity of this kingdom, perhaps she was there for such a time as this. I think that had to be going through, at least in thought, through Daniel's mind. 
Nebuchadnezzar's requirement seemed unjust. It reaches Daniel, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream is revealed to Daniel. We see that in verses 17 to 25. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles of Judah, from Judah, who can tell the king what his dream means. Let's go back a little bit. Daniel, again, uh, <laughs> he calls a prayer meeting, basically. And, uh, and uh, notice what they're praying for. Mercy. <laughs> they're going to get executed along with everybody else. Uh, and I can appreciate the fact that at least, you know, Daniel's able to go into the king. You know, I, I think that, the, you know, the Lord will give me the interpretation to the dream. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll see you later. And then he goes back to his friends. We got to pray, man. We got to really pray. Or we're all going to be killed. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that Daniel didn't assume anything. You know, he didn't walk back and go, oh, this thing's going on. King's got a dream. Guys can't interpret. Remember that thing? God gave me this gift, interpreting dreams. Been doing that a little bit. This is my time to really shine, boys. So, hey, you know, give me a high five. I'm on my way to see the king. Because, you know, as I get there, the Lord, I'm just trusting the Lord to kind of give it to me on the way. He doesn't do that. For all he knows, the Lord has raised him up to be martyred for his faith, that he might be an example to those that are in captivity to remain true to the God of heaven and earth. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's... So he doesn't assume that this is all going to work out to his goodwill and pleasure. He doesn't assume that, oh, I think this is it. I've always known I was destined for greatness. You know, this is my time. Now, he's, he's praying for mercy, not what he deserves. He doesn't deserve to have this interpreted. He doesn't deserve it at all. After all, he's one of the Jews that are in captivity. Why are they in captivity? Oh, that's right. They are being judged by God. Because as a nation, they turned away from him and turned into idolatry. He assumes nothing at this point. He gets these guys together, and they begin to plead for mercy. But again, it just speaks to us so much of the character of this young guy that's probably about 19 or so. Little pressure, little pressure, interpret dreams, good, come on in. What if I get it wrong? You're executed, but there's no pressure. Just give it your best shot at 19. And... Uh, but uh, verse 18, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of, of heaven. And then we notice that the, the mystery is revealed to Daniel. Daniel praised God for revealing the dream. Now, uh, back a few verses, you'll notice that when one of them says, and he answered them in Aramaic, from that point on all the way through chapter 7, Daniel writes the whole thing in Aramaic. We said in the syntax or the language style, that only existed during this time period. That's one of the reasons why we know Daniel had to have written it in the sixth century. It's also interesting, though, uh, because I, I'm told that uh, in Aramaic, this is, this is all poetry. It's written like a hymn, and more than likely, uh, uh, it was sung. Uh, God gives him the interpretation. He knows what the dream is. He knows the meaning of the dream. Uh, and the first thing he does is, is praise God. Uh, notice what he praises God for. First, he praises him for his character. Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Your name, Lord. I know what your name means. That's his reputation, what he stands for. Uh, again, that's what your name means. It's, it's your character. It's how people know you. We refer to the name of God. We're referring to his character. Two of those traits are mentioned here, wisdom and power. He praises him for his control over the world. 
verse 21. He sets up times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Daniel realizes that God is sovereign over all the affairs of man. And uh, he's the one that raises up. He's the one that, uh, uh, that brings them down. I thought it was a democracy, and I got my vote. Yeah, you got your vote, but God is the one that raises them up. God is the one that, uh, that, uh, that brings them down, and uh, he's the one that is sovereign, <clears throat> even world leaders. He praises God for his comprehension of all things, verse 22. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. Light dwells with him. And he praises him for his concern for believers. Verse uh, 23, very personal. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. He realizes God cares about him and his three friends. And God's going to uh, intervene and, and give him the, the interpretation. And then... Daniel informs uh, Ariok that the dream has been uh, revealed, and, uh, and this is kind of interesting, you know, because he, he says to him, uh, you know, and don't execute the wise men. You know, I have the dream. Daniel just saved their lives. After all, they're such good friends, you know. <laughs> you know, the other sorcerers and occultic guys that are running around casting spells on people. You know, they're, they're such great guys. You know, we see that later in the book as they try to get Daniel killed. Uh, they're such great guys. But here's a tremendous graciousness. You know, if it was me, it would have said, oh, Ariok, where are you going? Killing all the wise men. Okay, hey, I'll catch you later. I'll catch you later. Yeah, I got something to tell you, but you go right ahead. Comes back, oh, did I tell you? I got the interpretation of the dream. You don't have to kill the other. Oh, you killed them already? Oh, too bad. Hey, me and my buddies are cool, though, because I got the interpretation. Hey, wish I could have caught you sooner. That's not what Daniel does. He, he intervenes and actually saves these guys' lives that do not deserve to be saved. Uh, again, tremendous character qualities of this young man. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar's requirement seemed unjust, but God was in it. It reaches Daniel. God reveals the dream, and it turns out that Nebuchadnezzar's dream is representative of future kingdoms, as we've mentioned, and uh, verse 26 to 45. The king asked Daniel, who was called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me... This mystery has been revealed to me, not because I am greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron, partially of baked clay, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The whims swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom. Kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partially baked clay and partially of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partially iron and partially clay, so this kingdom will be partially strong and partially brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and not remain united. 
any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it uh, be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it's, uh, it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. The first thing we notice is that uh, Daniel gives God the glory. Uh, it's like no wise man, enchanter, magician. Hey, nobody can do this. It's not me. It's just that God cares about you, Nebuchadnezzar. He's given you this dream, and it's for a person, uh, a purpose, and he's allowed me to reveal it. But it's not because I'm a great person or anything special uh, about me at all. It's because of God's goodness and because, because of, of God's greatness. He wants you to know these things. The second thing, he tells them, about the representative kingdoms. And of course, he starts off with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. And uh, I think I got a little, there he is, and with the head of gold. I uh, have to have a snapshot. I don't know who had a digital camera around right then, but uh, nonetheless, we've got the, the statue here. Maybe it'll help you a little bit, at least visually. Uh, the, the thing about, uh, about these is obviously it, it, it moves down from a very precious metal uh, to, to less in, in terms of value. Uh, Daniel says, yours is the greatest kingdom, uh, and, and that was true. Nebuchadnezzar was the, uh, the king, as we'll see, that had tremendous power. What he said went. All the wise guys, you know, give this to me. You're executed. He doesn't have to check with anybody. He doesn't have to appeal with anybody. He is an absolute monarch. Everything he says, go. That is not true uh, of the other kingdoms that follow that. He is the head of gold. Uh, Herodotus, who was a historian that visited Babylon about 90 years after uh, the time of Nebuchadnezzar, could not get over and wrote extensively of the golden city. It's, uh, it's walls which were, were huge, so wide at the top, they, raced, they had chariot races around the tops of the walls uh, of, uh, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, city there. Uh, and in fact, portions of that had been uh, excavated in the old days, the archaeologists, whatever country they're from, this is nice, we'll take it back to our country. So you have to kind of visit Germany and England to see portions of this. A lot of it's still there. As you know, Saddam Hussein tried to identify with Nebuchadnezzar, and even because he was so great and powerful and even began to mint coins with Saddam Hussein's picture on one side and Nebuchadnezzar's picture uh, on, uh, on the other. I took a biblical archaeology class from a very well-known scholar and he brought to class artifacts. And one of the things he brought to class was one of the bricks from the wall from Nebuchadnezzar. It's like, yeah, just pass it around and look at it. No, that's okay. <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, okay, you take it, you take it. You know, it's like, it was, it was kind of neat, but it was kind of scary, too. You know, I had this little vicious thing in the back of my mind, because every day, here's a perfume bottle from the second century. Pass that around, you know. Bring a clay pot from the garden while it's being passed around. <laughs> Drop it in the back of the classroom. See if anybody had a heart attack. But um, it was uh, amazing what uh, archaeologists tell us about this kingdom. But it was the city of gold. And as Daniel said, these metals, uh, again, speak of the fact that there's a descending order in terms of power of the ruler, but they also speak of things that are indicative uh, of the, the empire uh, itself. So I want to read a, a passage from Jeremiah 27. Remember, Jeremiah's on the scene uh, in uh, Jerusalem predicting the 70-year captivity, predicting that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come uh, and the people are going into that captivity. And he's saying, this is just your, your just judgment from God. Just, just take it. You know, don't fight against this. It's what you deserve. Jeremiah 27, 4, he says, With my great power and out, outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are in it, and I give it to anyone I please. Now I will hand over your countries uh, over to my, notice, my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will make even wild animals subject to him. All nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. And that's exactly what happened. Nebuchadnezzar served on the throne. His son served on the throne. And his grandson, the kingdom was taken away from him by the Medes and the, uh, and the Persians, just as Jeremiah said. Daniel mentions a similar thing, that your rule is so powerful, even the animals are so subject to you. One of the things that uh, is interesting 
about uh, some of the artwork at that time and what we know from uh, archaeology is they there was uh, the lion was depicted you know through throughout their motifs you know the the throne you know with the lions there you know and everything those guys aren't there as bodyguards it's showing that even the king of the beast is is subject to this king he is so powerful i wonder if you read jeremiah uh, no, it's just, again, God speaking in advance what would be lived out uh, in reality. After Nebuchadnezzar, another kingdom would come, the kingdom of silver. Again, the, the chest and the arms of, uh, of silver. Uh, notice uh, this would have to have then also have been a, a divided kingdom. And uh, was it a divided kingdom? Yeah, it was the kingdom of the, the Medes and, and the Persians. We call it the, the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Uh, is very interesting that the Medes themselves, uh, their ancestors is believed to be the Kurds that live in northern Iraq today. At that time, of course, Persia, that was, that was part of their, their empire. Persia, remember a couple years ago, not long, a couple years ago changed its name to Iran. And, uh, and they realized that the Kurds were all part of that ancient kingdom. And they want it back. <laughs> Our friend over there, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, has kind of expressed that lately, that, oh, that's right, you're actually part of our kingdom, not part of Iraq. We want it back. Uh, but again, the, the kingdom, the Medes and the Persian, the Persian kingdom uh, is the uh, kingdom of silver. Well, wh where does the silver tie in? Uh, well, uh, this is a, a kingdom that um, uh, is... Uh, is run by silver. They're the ones that had silver coinage. Uh, they use it for uh, exchange. Uh, it's also, again, a, a divided kingdom. Uh, it's not, uh, the ruler there is not as powerful. We'll be introduced to one later in the book of Daniel. Remember, uh, when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, the king says, I'm sorry, Daniel, but I can't change what is written in the law. You know, even the king was subject to the law. He was not as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and, and silver was a motif. It's how they bought and sold and exchanged. These are the guys that come up with uh, this whole idea of commerce and so forth. And, and they had a, and a huge army. And we, in the, our book of uh, study of Esther, we read a bit about Xerxes and his battles against the Greeks and so forth. How's this? He was able, at one point in time, he had, he had a million foot soldiers. That wasn't all of his army. That's a pretty good army today. They have a, a million guy, infantry guys. Well, that's what Xerxes had in, uh, in his day. Uh, the next kingdom, the kingdom of bronze, uh, again, the, the belly and the thighs. Uh, so apparently, uh, again, an inferior metal, uh, in a way, uh, stronger. Verse 39, it says uh, uh, something unique about this kingdom. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule the whole earth. Well, again, what kingdom came next, and does it fit the picture here? And, uh, and it was the Greek uh, kingdom, the king of Alexander the Great. What was uh, uh, the thing that was noted about uh, him? Bronze. They had developed bronze weaponry, and they used it uh, tremendously. Uh, then, and again, these metals were directly associated with these, with these kingdoms. Again, did Alexander have the kind of power that Nebuchadnezzar? No way. Did he even have the kind of uh, a power that the kings of the Medo-Persian have? No, uh, but he ruled with tremendous military might. How far? Fills the whole earth. The Bible said it was. What do we know about Alexander at the age of what, 32, 33, sitting on the river Euphrates? A little drunk, but besides that, there's other reasons he's crying because he says, there are no more worlds for me to conquer. Uh, again, what Daniel said about the kingdom of bronze is, uh, came, came to be. We also know that it was a, a divided kingdom, and, uh, and that's what happened, as you recall. His, uh, he had no heirs, he dies very young. His four generals take over. Two of them rise to prominence that we know from histor history, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. The Seleucids uh, uh, basically from that general and his heirs ruled in Syria. The Ptolemies took control of Egypt uh, and again have tremendous battles with each other that later in the book of Daniel, he'll give us the details of those battles in their fight over Israel uh, in particular. The kingdom of Iron two legs, uh, again another divided kingdom, and this of course is Rome. They come in and and uh, and take over from 
from the, the Greeks. And uh, it talks about the fact that they will crush and smash all the others. And that's what the Romans were known for. Many of these other kingdoms, when they invaded a land, they got control. They said, okay, just pay your taxes and, uh, and we're cool. Uh, the only exception was, was bringing the Jews into captivity. But everybody else, it's, you left them alone. Romans didn't do that. When they went into an area, they just slaughtered everybody. They just slaughtered them. They put absolute fear in people's hearts and minds. Uh, they were able at one point in time to, to close their temple of war down because of what was known as the Pax Roma, the Peace of Rome. They had the Peace of Rome because they, it said, had an iron hand that they ruled with. And so there's the iron. Not only there in terms of the way that they ruled, the way that they conquered, but weaponry as well. Iron becomes the, 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 the weapon of choice uh, and, and superior to uh, someone carrying a bronze sword and they're able to gain uh, a victory. Again, a divided kingdom. They fight for, uh, for years uh, between the east and the west. And finally, Theodosius, the emperor, officially divides the kingdom to the Byzantine, the eastern side and the western side, puts his two sons, one over each of the kingdom, just as Daniel said. It would be a divided kingdom. The value is decreasing as it goes along. We would certainly say a decrease in beauty and glory uh, as well. Uh, and then we get to the, uh, the feet of iron and clay. The Bible says a brittle mixture. And, uh, uh, but it's a continuation of the iron, which is the Roman Empire. Uh, we also note that in verse 44, there seems to be a time gap. These other kingdoms are one in, after another after another. Verse 44 says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Those kings, because the feet have 10 toes that are representative of 10 kings. So in the future, yet there will be a revival of the Roman Empire, which by the way, is not ended. I mean, yeah, it was taken over, it was destroyed, but the idea of the Roman thought and so forth is still with us. Not sure, that's why I'm up here teaching and you're sitting there listening. This is a Roman, this is a Western concept idea. Permeates our thinking the way we think. Uh, you don't notice it unless you go to some place like India or you go to some place uh, like China or somewhere else or you go somewhere in the Pacific where if we were teaching, we'd be out. I'd show you, you do it. I'd watch you do it. We do it together. You're doing it fine. I walk away. It's a different way of teaching. We, the Westerners, we lecture because of the Greeks. We could go on and on. The Roman, the Roman thought is still, uh, is still here with us. And that empire is going to be revived again, uh, yet future. There's going to be ten kings, the ten toes that uh, will be raised up among it. Uh, and it is uh, the final human kingdom. It is the kingdom of the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. Daniel's not done yet. He will have a lot more to, to say about it. But again, Daniel predicted in advance in the 6th century a succession of kingdoms that would come that would decrease in power but be world empires. And he named particular characteristics about uh, each, each one of them. Uh, you can either believe, again, that, uh, that God spoke to Daniel, that his word is inspired, or you go with the guy in the time capsule thing, you know, so that, you know, you got a couple of options there. But uh, amazing, uh, the accuracy, and uh, as we said, Daniel's not done. Uh, there's a couple more chapters where he's going to go into more specific details about these kingdoms. And of course, what interests us a great deal is this final kingdom uh, that we would know would be a revived Roman Empire. So it's got to be raised up out of Europe. We used to be speculate as to what it would be called. Speculation has ended. We call it the European Union today. And, uh, and we know that uh, already they have mapped out around the world 10 economic uh, world areas so that economy can flow, so it can, the world can be ruled uh, by a central place in, in Europe and so forth, uh, is not speculation. These, it's, it, they've drawn it up. They've got the charts and the maps and how it will function and, uh, and operate. We're, we're living close to those times. Uh, the last kingdom is uh, the rock not cut by human hands. Again, the only hope for the world. This is a return uh, of Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, in the time of those kings, those ten kings, uh, the revived Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, this is in verse 44, that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. 
but uh, itself will, will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Uh, and again, uh, it's worth noting that, uh, that the rock really, in the dream, smashes the feet, the last kingdom. And this is speaking of Jesus Christ coming back at the end of the, the tribulation period. Gen Jesus identifies himself as the stone, uh, as the rock, many times in Scripture. Isaiah predicted of the Messiah, Isaiah 28, 16, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, for a sure foundation, the one who trusts will never be dismayed. And then Jesus identifies with that in Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said to them, have you ever read in the scriptures? Speaking to the, uh, the Pharisees and this corrupt leadership there at the time. Uh, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Get two options of Jesus as a stone. You can fall on him and be broken to pieces. And, and he'll, he'll heal you and make you who he really meant you to be all alone. Or you can wait and he'll fall on you and you'll be crushed. Because when he returns again, he came first as a suffering servant to die for the sins of the world. He's going to come again. And when he comes again, he's, he's coming to judge the world. And it's, uh, it's not a pretty picture. The last thing we hear is uh, Nebuchadnezzar give recognition to Daniel and his God. Verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and order that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, placed him in charge of all of his wise men, Moreover, as Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. And just two things quickly. Daniel's God is recognized by, by Nebuchadnezzar, and keep that in mind. I mean, this is a, a huge thing to him, obviously. This is a dream that he's recurring for years. Uh, it begins in the second year of his reign. It's at least four or five years later. It's finally revealed to him. It's absolutely what he was dreaming in every detail. Now there's an explanation for it uh, that makes sense to him. And he falls prostrate. Can you imagine the, the most powerful person in the world then gets down and lays, I mean, we're talking about face on the ground, be prostrate before you. Yours is the real God. Yours is the God of heaven. Yours is the God that reveals mysteries. How does Nebuchadnezzar do after this? <laughs> Not too good. Not too good. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Somebody could come to this realization. Hey, what the Bible said is true. There is a God in heaven. He did send his son to be the savior of the world. Man, I realized I didn't get that. I get that now. And then just walk off and like it never happened. It, that goes on. But uh, God's not through with Nebuchadnezzar. He becomes the first werewolf in the Bible. Very interesting story. There's some interesting things that happen in the book of, of, of Daniel. God is definitely not done with Nebuchadnezzar uh, yet. And then Daniel and his friends are recognized and given authority. And we see Daniel, again, the idea of remaining the city gate or the royal court. I mean, he's been exalted to a very high position. He doesn't forget his three friends and makes sure that they are raised up and uh, exalted uh, as well. It's, a, it's, it's an incredible study, and, uh, and we could have even gone to, uh, to more detail. It's a little a bit of a challenge to cover 49 verses you know, in, in, uh, in one message, but we pretty much need to do it all, all in context. And as I said, uh, Daniel's not done yet. If you've never heard all this before, it's a little bit to keep, tough to keep up with uh, the first time. But a guy in the 6th century predicted all the world kingdoms and characteristics about those kingdoms. It'll be literally absolutely impossible if God didn't exist and God doesn't see the end from the beginning. And as I said, he will go on later with his other prophecies of future events that are astounding. Astounding why? Because we, we, they've, already been, they've already come and gone. 
part of the ancient world. We can look at the archaeological remains. We can look at the written records and find out, man, Daniel was right on. But the big thing is Daniel speaks of things that are still yet future. Future for us. Uh, again, more details later about this idea of a Roman Empire that gets revived, that has ten kings like ten toes over it. He's going to tell us later, one of those is going to raise up and take the others out, and he will gain control over the whole thing. We refer to him as, as the Antichrist. When we study Bible prophecy, we often say it's like, throughout the Bible, it's like pieces of a puzzle. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I, okay, I get the piece, but how does that fit in? Daniel kind of gives us some big overviews so that we can understand other areas, other prophecies, other things that are going on. So it becomes a very important study for us. But again, we should remember that uh, uh, it teaches us the Bible is God's inspired word. If all of this happened with complete accuracy, we have to believe that everything it says in the future is going to happen and go down the same way. Uh, boy, there's less and less that speculation because we're kind of living in, uh, in those days and it seems like the, the, the time is close in hand. We need to learn the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar as well. I don't know where you're at with the, the Lord today, and you could go, wow, that's really interesting. Man, I never heard that. That's really, wow, maybe the Bible's really true. Well, it really is true. And, and you could say, man, I guess there is a God in heaven. You could agree with what Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, and uh, please don't fall prostrate this morning, though. But you could agree with what he said and have it make no difference at all in your life. That's what's astounding to me. It shouldn't be, because... <laughs> That's how I was for 28 years. I went, yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. I'm just going to still do my own thing. And uh, ended up really just, you know, wasting my life, destroying myself. Uh, the idea is that if God is there and he's reaching out and he's speaking, his word is true, then his offer of forgiveness of sins, eternal life, see, that's all part and parcel of the whole thing. And as the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. The Babylonian religion it's still around. It's still here. There's still a struggle, evil against good. Uh, it's, uh, we see it. It's becoming more, more prevalent, isn't it? Uh, it's becoming more obvious out there. And we will end up following one or the other. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm kind of neutral right now. Now, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. Well, can I just kind of be it? No, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. And uh, it's, it's just where we, uh, we need to come to the place where we understand and then we make a decision to bow our knees to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and say, man, you died for me so I can be forgiven of all of my sins? Yeah, he did. Are you sure? He rose again from the dead. Are you sure? It's the most easily proven fact of all antiquity. If, if, you, if you don't reason it out intellectually, you almost have to kind of check your brain at the door uh, because there's all the evidence there for, for his resurrection. Who he is, prophetic prophecy, it's all there. You have to kind of shut something down to not kind of get this. And uh, it's so important that we don't be a Nebuchadnezzar, that we don't pass by God's offer of love and, and forgiveness.